Well, thank thank you. Can you, am, am I there? Yeah. Thank you, Pastor Joe. I appreciate that. And uh, thank you for having me. I wasn't intending on coming down here and sitting in front of you and talking. Uh, I was coming down here to vacation. And Joe said, I, he, we talked a day or two later, and he says, well, I'd like you to speak on Shabbat. And I'm like, and they said, oh, I'd like you to do a radio show or a couple of, you know, whatever. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> but anyway, after meeting several of you, many of you last night, and coming down here and being a part of Louisiana and really literally escaping from what I call the Third Reich in Washington <laughs> State, um, this has been wonderful and I'm very happy to be here in fact the memories that you folks have given to me to take home are going to help me get through the lunacy that we're suffering in Washington State because there's parts of our nation that are not being sucked into this hole of lunacy I only I only know how to say it that way but I'm gonna talk about something having to do with the lunacy that I sometimes think we don't really think about. So, Well, before we get into that, so tell us a little bit about uh, just your upbringing. Uh, I, I know there's some things you want to get to, but I, wanna, I want people to kind of know where you came from. It gives a good context. Okay, so, so people always ask me, you know, I, when I get into this quote-unquote Torah stuff, I've had many, many people ask me, are you Jewish? So my answer to those people, one lady in particular, she said, are you Jewish? And I go, no, I'm just a Negro from New York. <laughs> and <laughs> she, she didn't know how to take that, okay? I think she got offended. As many of you might not. It's, I don't know how much of it is genuine laughter, how much of it is <laughs> He said it, he said it. Now, now the reason why I say that is because I grew up in the 70s. I'm a child, I was born in 1959. And um, we were poor. My mother raised seven kids by herself. Um, and it was, it was an amazing difficulty. So I grew up in a time where they were talking about be black and proud. And I was like, mama was always saying, I'm black and poor. <laughs> and she wasn't proud of that. So we survived. We got through it. But mama didn't play the race game. She, she had five sons and two daughters, and she wasn't going to allow us to be sucked into the color of our skin and see the world from that lens. So I was raised with that perspective. In fact, there was a time when I came in the door and I said some words that I shouldn't have said, and she smacked me twice. I'm like, what'd you hit me for? And she said, you will address those people by their name, not the color of their skin. So that's the way we were raised. And uh, it was a difficult time. It was a very difficult time. And it wasn't until I began to have children and, and you know, married and whatnot, I began to understand how is it possible for a woman to raise seven kids, let alone one child by herself. So I understand that. But we were poor, and I finally, I told my mother, I went to a, a school away from home. I was there for three or four years, um, and it changed my perspective on everything because I began to realize there were a lot of people, kids, that had bigger problems. I always say, those, those, those white kids, they had the kind of problems money could buy. And, uh, and they had some horrific problems. And so I began to understand that everybody was struggling. And it wasn't a black and white thing. It was a um, lawless thing that permeated all of our lives. And we had to figure out how to, how to get through it. So I finally moved to the Pacific Northwest in 1977. I was a 17-year-old kid, gave my life to Christ, and uh, for the next 25 years didn't understand what any of that meant, literally. I kept going to church, and I would always hear, well, the Jews didn't get it. Now, this, the reason I'm telling you this is because this was a big part of my roadblock to understanding that book because I would go, well, if the Jews didn't get it, why are you asking me to turn to Galatians 3 and read what they wrote? That was a big issue for me. I couldn't get past that. And so I, I would ask the pastors, 
If the Jews didn't get it, why are you teaching their material every Sunday? <laughs> that, was a, that was a prayer. I kept asking the Lord, I don't understand this. Why do we throw the Jews under the bus? Literally, this was my question. This was my quandary. And in 2007, I was sitting in, in the church that I was attending in Vancouver, Washington. This is many, many years after, after becoming a Christian and backsliding. Back, I didn't backslide. I leaped <laughs> away from the Lord and went through a whole drug period, just a whole mess, okay? But when I finally gave my life back to the Lord, he delivered me from the drug issue overnight. One day I was trapped in this lie, and the next day I was, wasn't. And so that began to become the turning point. That was in 1998. Shortly after that, I had a car accident um, where I should have not survived. And then I had a brain aneurysm. My doctor said, you're not supposed to be talking to me. You died two weeks ago, medically. And then I had, uh, I'm, I'm a recent cancer survivor. The last uh, 2010, I was diagnosed with stage four cancer. It's, a, it's kind of a, in the throat. You'll notice part of this side of me is skinny and this part is still chunky. Um, but I, I was brought through all of that. They found the cancer, they cut it out, and I've been cancer-free for going on 11 years now. So it's been, a, it's been that kind of story. But as I was uh, talking one day in the congregation, the, pastor, the pastors were gone. They were gone to a wedding, so they had a person, his name was Greg, he was teaching. And he said, can you believe those Jews went back to that temple worship? Foolish Jews, he used the word foolish Jews. And so I went, I literally put my head down, because what he was talking about was the Jews were going back to the temple of Israel. But they actually were not. They were going back to the temples of Diana and Hellenism and Apollo. And uh, I put my head down and I went, Lord, uh, why do we always throw the Jews under the bus? And a few seconds later, I heard in this side of my head, because I was Jewish and they don't know why. And so I did like this, because I thought my friend, him and his wife, used to always sit behind us. I turned around, I said, what'd you say? He goes, we didn't say nothing. So I, I turned over and I looked at my wife, she's like, what? And I go, I know I just heard a voice. And a few seconds later, I, we were in Galatians 3, that's what he was talking about, the, the Greg. A few seconds later, it, and I'm looking at the book and I hear the same voice, and it was like all sound was gone. All I could hear was the voice. And the voice said, is this not the material I purposed them to teach you? Go learn why. <sighs> 30 days later, literally 30 days later, I went to a conference in Vancouver, Washington. Uh, Senator uh, Joe Zarelli and his wife put on this conference where they were bringing Jewish people and Christians together, just to bring together. And while I was there, I, I walked up to this table. It was big round tables. It was, there was probably, I don't know, close to 1,200 people in the room. I was one of the only other black persons in the room. The other guy was from Nairobi. He was really black. <laughs> and <laughs> that's why I knew he was there. <laughs> but um, I walked up to a table, and I, I said, is a seat taken? And I, they allowed me to sit there. I didn't know anybody at the table. And I start talking to this guy. He starts talking to me. He wants to know why an African-American is wanting to be here. You know, he's kind of intrigued by that. And he says, well, I've never met too many African-Americans who know this much about Israel. And I looked at him and I said, first of all, sir, I, I, I'm not an African-American. I'm an American. Um, I, I don't know anything about Africa other than it's a continent. And he, so while I'm talking to him, he's writing down these names, and he goes, have you ever seen the gospel in the book of Genesis? And I'm like, I'm, I'm starting to think this guy's a little off, okay? <laughs> Literally. And then I said, well, no, and I'm trying to figure out what he's doing, and he's writing these names, and then he's writing next to them meanings, and so he says, well, just read this. So I read it, it said Adam, Seth, it went all the way down to Noah, and I was like, he goes, did you see the gospel? And I'm like, okay, this guy really is nuts. And I said, no. And he said, let me show you what they mean in Hebrew. And he goes, because we have to understand 
why God was Jewish. So I read it. Mankind is appointed to a fixed dwelling place. God who is, um, I, I forget the whole thing. God who is, God who is, uh, uh, comes down to instruct, but is beaten, tortured, and smitten to bring peace. And I went, that's the gospel message. And as soon as I said the word peace, I got a download. It was like something, a switch was clicked on. And it was, it was, it was, it was very hard. I've had told this story many, many times. It was like somebody took a squeegee and just wiped everything that I knew biblically out of my spirit. And I was left with wondering, what just happened? And the guy reached over to me and said, are you okay? And I'm like trying to figure out what just happened. And I said, I don't know. I, I was a little shell-shocked. And then he said, well, my name is Mark Biltz, and I'm the pastor of El Shaddai Ministries. And that began the door that opened up the answer to a prayer. Because I, start, I used to drive from uh, Vancouver, Washington to El Shaddai for two years, once a month. It's a two-hour drive. Just to find out what this man was teaching. And so Mark opened a door for me and I spent probably 10 years, 10, 11 years in the congregation. But the more that I learned from him, the more I wanted to understand more. So I set up a website. I reached out to, I wasn't, I wasn't, I had no problem reaching out to the Ricos and all of these people. And I, I wanted to learn what was in my head because I didn't understand it. But it wasn't, Jesus died for my sin and I'm going to go to heaven when I die and that was completely gone, completely gone. I started understanding the covenant structure and the way God does things, and I started seeing above and beyond what we learned, but I still wasn't sure how to put this all together. You know, I started seeing all these people talking about tour, and I'm thinking, geez, tour is not something that you carry around in a suitcase. It's, a, it's God's way of teaching you how to behave. And so as I started... Say, say that again. Torah is not something you carry around with you. It's God teaching you how to behave, teaching us how to behave. And I began to see the difference between Torah and religion, and I began to see that the way we've understood religion is very divisive. So if you have, and I said this to a few people last night, if you have the Catholic church taking up one block then around the corner you got the Lutherans you got the Baptists a few streets over and then you got the uh, Pentecostals and the assembly folks they're all in the same neighborhood and the one thing they all have in common is they don't know each other and I began to see that what we've done to the religious system that God wanted us to understand behavior by is actually something we use to divide by and so I said, okay, that's it. I'm not going to talk about religion anymore, and I'm not here to talk about religion. I'm not here to talk about the miracle of the cross. I'm here to talk about the miracle of the kingdom. And that, to me, is why the Messiah came. He didn't come to make us better Christians. He came to show us how to do better and to be better. And I'm going to ask you all to do something during this conversation because I'm, I'm hoping that you get a hold of this. Because believe it or not, I'm one of the people in the audience online that you say hello to every week, okay? I, I'm learning from you. I'm learning from Kyle. I'm learning of this thing about the parables. It's like, whoa, I sit in my bedroom watching this and I'm doing somersaults because you're connecting dots for me. And I'm not a teacher. I'm a person who shares the information that has been taught to me. I, the, being a teacher is a, <clears throat> in the kingdom of God, it's an awesome responsibility and a great, big, gigantic uh, accountability is held to you. So I, I like to take the easy way. Lord, I don't want to be a teacher. <laughs> I just want to talk about what the teachers tell me. And then I go, look, if you don't do your own research, throw your Bible away, it's not doing you any good. Right. It's really not. So I, I want to say, too, that 
you know, we, we say hi to a lot of people on every Shabbat. I know a lot of them. There's a lot of people that watch that I don't know that just kind of lurk. You know, they're just kind of lurkers, and that's cool, and we love lurkers. That's, that's awesome. <laughs> Shabbat lurkers. shalom to all you lurkers out there. It's cool. <laughs> um, but I, I just want to say for you guys need to know <coughs> that when this man believes in something, it's a thousand percent. We have, we have another OAM three times this size in the Pacific Northwest that you don't know about, all because of Jeff Morton. Uh, Ser I'm serious. When we said, hey, um, we found this building, and so like we need 30 grand as a down payment, <laughs> Jeff goes, okay, I'm gonna help. And more money came from the Pacific Northwest than came from anywhere else, including here locally. And that's not to shame anybody. That's not what I'm saying. I want you to understand that, that as real as this is to all of us who sit in here every week and enjoy each other and love each other, there are people out there that this is just as real to. They're just not here physically. I don't even know how that works. Right. But everyone that I know watches from that region of the country, a two or three state area, is all connected somehow or another to to Jeff Morton and so um, I, he's, a, he's a, a teacher that identifies as not a teacher we I can identify as anything right so you can identify however you want I guess I'm the, I, I'm the uncolored teacher the uncolored teacher <laughs> I, I wrote a book called Uncoloring Race so yeah and we'll, we'll talk about the some of the stuff you're doing towards the end but so one of the things that amazes me so much about Jeff, and he's helped to stretch me. If, if you've heard, if you've picked up on things that, that maybe Colin and I have said, or I've said the last several months, in, especially in the light of our current politics in America, and, and if I've said some stuff that kind of made you uncomfortable or made you think about, well, he's getting really kind of political, and what do you mean the Bible is about politics and government and all that kind of stuff? He's to blame. He's to blame for it. Because Jeff thinks about, about the Bible in a way that I've never heard anybody talk about. And, and we've talked about, we, I read it on this one week, I can't remember what it was, but how we've separated, Christians have separated religion and politics when really they are inseparable. They're the same system, they're the same structure, they're the same, they're the same everything. How many, and you may not think about stuff like this, because you may not be an overthinker, but I know a lot of you are. Have, have you watched what goes on in, po in politics? And I'm not just talking about the last few months. I'm talking about the last 50 years. Have you ever looked at the way some of our political leaders act? And has the thought ever crossed your mind, I know a pastor like that. <coughs> or have you ever sat in a, been in a church and had a pastor and you ever thought, I know some politicians like that. Start to think about it a little bit. And what you'll realize is that pastors and politicians are very close to the same thing. A politi we had this conversation the other day, and I, it hit me like a bat. There's a lot of pastors in America today that should have run for office instead of ever stepping foot behind a pulpit. Yep. Because what are politicians supposed to do? They're supposed to shepherd the people. Look at all the patriarchs. Look at all the people in the Bible. What were they? Were they pastors? No, they were kings and judges. And what was their job? To shepherd, the, to care for the people. We got a lot of preachers that are pastoring churches that really should be kissing babies and shaking hands and making righteous law. Yep. And Jeff is, is the guy who helped turn me on to that. So this is not the crux of what he wants to talk about, but just for... Put put twenty five years of understanding into like five minutes. Well, it, it's it's everything no that pressure. I'm going to talk about is tied to that because um, if you if you why do we sit here and learn about Abraham or Isaac or Jacob or the disciples or Paul or Joshua or Esther or Mordecai? The one thing that they all had in common, every single one of the people that I just mentioned to you, is they had to go up against the political dynasty. 
a political situation. See, the template for politics is not ours, it's God's. The template for schools is not ours, it's God's. The template for marriage, the template for birth, the template for everything is what we were gifted. This is what we have to learn from. So what we do is we pervert it because we don't understand the behavior that God has placed all of humanity in in order for he, what he's doing to be fulfilled. Kind of, sort of. Because he's going to fulfill what he's doing whether we do it or not. So, you know, I, I was thinking about this this morning. Jesus take the wheel. Well, let's say Jesus took the wheel. Well, he took the wheel and he drove us through World War II. Millions of people died. He drove us through the Holocaust. He drove us through slavery. So when Jesus takes the wheel, he's still driving the, the boat. Just what are you doing? What are we doing? So when people say, well, God is in control, I say, yeah, he was in control when Hitler was around too. He was in control when the Jews were forced to walk in the gas chambers and the, and the blacks and the whites and just about every race on the planet was enslaved. Black folks do not corner the market on slavery. Slavery has been around for years because we have empire and we have people that want to raise themselves up to be godlike. That's what Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Esther, Yeshua, the disciples, Paul, they were all battling tyrannical government. And you and I, believe it or not, are fighting tyrannical government. Talk, just again I don't want to stay here too long but we could but this could be like a two day thing <laughs> touch on because you said something the other day and I was just like wait what this we talked about uh, we've had like two or three days together so I got a lot to process but <clears throat> how many of our hope our hope is over there right right our hope is, is over there. It's, it's tomorrow, or it's, it's up there. It's in heaven, because that's where God is, and that's where the kingdom is. Our, our, our hope is in tomorrow because, well, joy comes in the morning. So today might be crummy, but tomorrow God promised would be better. Our, our hope and our, our joy and our peace and our strength and our vitality and all of that stuff, is it always seems to be over there. And, and Jeff and I talked about that the kingdom is not something else. The kingdom is what we see here. So can you kind of unpack that a little bit? Because I'm not well, doing a good job of well, it. That's why, you know, I, that's why I say the, the miracle of the cross is, is one thing. But the miracle of the kingdom is why the cross happened in the first place. And so when we understand that the kingdom of God, God said, I built a place to dwell amongst my creation. And so he moved in. So when you understand the pattern of house building, my, my co-host, Dr. Dina Dye, and I got I to gotta tell you something. A lot of the information that I'm talking about, I learned from others. D Dr. Dina Dye, she blew my mind. And I went, okay, that hole that I had after the download, she literally was the one person who started filling all that in. And so her message is, we're in the kingdom now. This is the kingdom. You represent the kingdom of God. And the way the world realizes it is when you line our behavior up to his authority. That's what the Torah message was all about. So when you, if you, if you just look at the five senses, you know, this is how, this blew my mind. We can touch, taste, smell. You know, you know, you know, you know what they are. You know, Biden. <laughs> you, you all know what they are. But if you, if I ask you to describe what chicken tastes like, B 
the best you can do is compare it to something. But chicken itself, and water and air, they're really kind of indescribable. But with all of those five senses, God makes you aware of who he is. Because we're living in his air, we're walking on his ground, we're eating his food, we're seeing what he's created, and we're hearing his sound. And so he put all of us into his kingdom, into his house, into his government, into his religious understanding, into his family. So I want, I'm, I'm going to ask you to do something because to really kind of understand this and to understand just how valuable you are, I am, Joe is, to the kingdom of God, I'm going to ask you to kind of just close your eyes for a moment because everything we do here, and, and go ahead and close your eyes because I'm going to keep talking. Everything we do here is to go back and unpack the Torah, the gospel, the living word of the Bible, the history, everything. So I want you to go back into the moment of Abraham. Only I want you to leave your electricity here, your car here, your manufacturing, your heated homes. Everything that you see the world through, leave it here and go back to Abraham or Isaac or Jacob or Moses and try to see the world the way they saw the world because they didn't have electricity they didn't have water running into their homes they didn't have toilets they didn't have I could list I could do this for 35 40 minutes of all the things they didn't have so their reference to everything that we understand has nothing to do with what we have. Remember, the Bible wasn't written to us, but it was written for every generation. But those people wrote the Bible based on what they had. And so to try to understand what it was like to walk through the Red Sea, no boat, no gas, to wander around in the wilderness, with nothing. So to that world, everything was about what God was doing, whether it was our God, the God of the Bible, or all the man-made gods. Everything they credited to the gods. And the pharaohs and all of those Roman centurions and the, 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 uh, the, the Roman Caesars and the kings, and the, if, if, if they could somehow be godlike, then they could control the political reality of the people that didn't have what we have. So that's why some guy would walk into some temple and come out and say that the god Molech told him to tell you this. And now he's, he's, he's got some kind of authority over you because they're all expecting to hear from the god and then he comes out and interprets the god. And now pretty soon all these people are following a sort of enslavement. That's kind of where our government is heading today. So we're not different from the ancient world. We're a product of it. And so when we have government, is it the government of the righteous God or is it the government of some man who wants to be like God? And every single person that we're talking about fought against that system. That's why we talk about them today. Now, it gets even better. You guys can open your eyes because I want you to kind of imagine the world that they lived in because when you're reading their words, we're reading an interpretation that they interpreted. <laughs> but they interpreted it without paragraphs, sentences. So their world was based on, had nothing to do with science. It had to do with mythology. That's Dina Dye talking, by the way. Their world was myth mythological. So I always say, and I'm going to a bigger point here, so kind of follow me. I always say that if I showed to Moses a photograph 
a photograph, I'm saying photograph specifically, taken by the Hubble telescope of the Earth, he would look at it and go, wow, that's cool, what, what is that? Because he wouldn't know what a photograph was. And he wouldn't know that he was looking at the picture that, of the Earth that he's standing on. He, he would have no concept of that. So when he's talking about heaven and Earth, what's his reference? So when you go back to his world, his reference is based on the gods lived in the sky and on the mountains. Not outer space. Not out of space. Right. It's called tripart. It's, it's a tripart system. The earth was one thing, and the gods lived on the mountains. And I'm not going to get into a lot of that because I'll lose all of you. We've I'm done, pretty we've sure done a lot that. of this. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah. That's right, you have. Yeah. Uh, um, so when, you, when, you, when we understand it from their lens, now our job is to understand why did Abraham feel obligated to do what he did? Why did Esther feel obligated to do what she did? Why did the disciples give up their lives 1,500 years later? Why did Paul go up against the government system, the philosophical, the collegiate world of his day to tell us about the kingdom of God? That's why we talk about these people because they went up against the system in order for us to understand that covenant relationship that they had with the creator of the universe. They weren't perfect people. I mean, if I open up the trunk of my car, you guys run down the street going, oh my God, because we're not perfect. We're not going to be perfect. But when we start understanding the Torah, then we have a road map to do the most incredible things. I mean, mind-blowing things, and we're going to talk about that yeah, I think, in a second. I think maybe a good pivot point for getting to that is <clears throat> how many of us are waiting when we talk about hope being over there and things like that, how many of us are waiting for God to replace our current government with a kingdom government, whatever that means? How many of us are waiting for God to replace the current governmental systems with kingdom government? Are you following me? Our government systems, we look at them, we think they're corrupt. God's going to have to wipe the whole thing clean and replace it with something from heaven or replace it with something else. And yet the, the biblical story is that the, the government system that we have, whatever shape or form it looks like, it may be twisted away from God's original design, but that is the government. It's how we're treating it and how we're doing it. Right. Hanok says, told me a couple weeks ago we're talking, we we're talking about the Messianic age, and he said that his his rabbi used to always tell them when Messiah, and this is a, a Jewish understanding, but when Messiah comes, stores are still going to be open, cops are still going to be patrolling the streets, people are still going to go to work. You still buy flowers for your wife? Life doesn't, as we know it, doesn't change. But the scripture says that righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. So what if we're not looking for a government that falls from the sky? But what if we're looking, our God is waiting for righteous people to make the government he already gave us? Because Jeff says something else. God never left earth. He gave us this, he, he designed this place and he says, I'm going to create this earth. We talked about this in our Genesis series. I'm going to create this place so I can dwell with you. And God came and walked with Adam in the cool of the day. When did God leave? He never did. So what if instead of replacing these corrupt governmental systems that we see, and that's what we're hoping for, what, is the, what about instead of that, some righteous people actually take those places and turn the government, current corruption and chaos into order and begin to lift the oppression off of people and begin to, to deal in, in equality and righteousness and justice. What if, what if that's the coming of the kingdom? 
You know why we don't like that or why it's hard for us to wrap our minds around that? Because many, many of us have been told or taught or conditioned that we're saved, we're going to heaven, kick your feet back, you know, kick back, put your feet up and relax because Yeshua is going to do all this stuff that we can't do. And we have neutered our own responsibility and our own ability to affect the world that God has given to us. If you don't like the way the world looks, it's not Jesus's fault. It's not God's fault. It's your fault because he gave it to you to affect. He's never left. He's waiting for you to engage. I, I can't. Y'all are shaking your head and going, yeah, yeah, yeah. I hope you're, I hope you're getting it like, I get, like I'm getting it because it's overwhelming so much to the point that I can't hardly even put it into words. What we're looking for is not over there, guys. It's right here. Didn't Yeshua say the kingdom is here? The kingdom is... Stop looking over there. If you want to see it changed, change. Are you asking us to run for political office? I've said the last several weeks, if, if you feel even an inkling to get involved in politics and you feel like that's God you better get after it figure it out <laughs> and we'll donate to your campaign I, I don't know we can't do that we're a 501c3 but anyway <laughs> sorry we'll edit that um, no but but you better do that yeah individually thank you you better do that because we're waiting on God to replace what we've messed up and God is looking at us going no I'm waiting for you to fix what you've messed up by the way I am instructing you to fix it, which is Torah. Which is his instructions. And the reason why that's critical that we understand, I mean, it is absolutely critical that we understand this is because when God calls us to do something, that means he's, he's received your choice to be a, a messenger of his kingdom. And he's honoring that. By saying, okay, what, what do you want to do? And then he says something really cool. He says, well, that, that might work. Uh, can I help you? What can I do to help you? Because the ideal is to bring the two together. Mm -hmm. And just like the Messiah was nailed to a tree, a tree represented like the connecting point in the ancient world, it was the thing that connected. It was, it was the strength of all humanity. And so he wants to bring the two together. And that's the example Messiah gave to all of us. He did something. You ever wonder why the Messiah came up out of the water? And rather than go out and start talking to the folks, he went and attacked the government. Because <laughs> he, he had the protocol to do that. He had been mikvahed into the position of high priest and king. So now he went and did what he's asking us to do. I have a website called freefromfear.us. And the idea behind that is if we're afraid to represent the kingdom of God, then why are we learning Torah? Because that's what we need to take into the world in order to be the light. Why are we not understanding the gospel message? The gospel message was about a bunch of people reacting to the letters and the confirmation that the Old Testament was real and they grabbed that banner and they went out there and they said, okay, we're going to confront the things that are wrong in the kingdom of God. And they paid with their lives. But that's not the end of the story. So before we get too far away from where I want to go with this, I want y'all to close your eyes again. I feel very Baptist. This, make, this reminds me of being very Baptist. And I, I want you to... Now remember, as you listen to my voice, everything that that world thought of had to do with the gods. Are we pleasing the gods? Are we doing what the gods want us to do? Israel was the same way. It was no different. So now let's bring Abraham... Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Joshua, Esther, Mordecai, all of the disciples, Paul. Let's bring them all into our world. 
turn on the light switch for Paul. Watch his reaction. Take Abraham for a ride in your car down the freeway. <laughs> turn on the faucet in your house. Watch a plane. Watch the reaction of disciples when they see a plane or a helicopter fly across the sky. Take them into a grocery store, shopping center. Take them to the movies. See, in their mind, they're thinking, wow, look what God has done. Holy smokes. Everything that you show them is miraculous. It is beyond their comprehension. They can't even wrap their mind around it, but they're going to credit God with doing it through us. In spite of the wars and the famines and the death and the destruction behind the scenes, the kingdom of God is being built and presented to all of humanity by our hands through our works because of what he has promised us to do. And his loyalty to each and every one of us is to keep that promise, to bring forth the kingdom of God. So all of these people that are now walking around in our world are seeing miracle upon miracle upon miracle, and they're like blown away. Because they see what 3,800 years later represents. God is still developing his kingdom. And he's using us to do it. And those of us who have accepted the obligation to be in covenant relationship with him are fighting against the tyranny that's trying to stop it. That's trying to control us. And so they see that. They're going to say, wow, that person is a ruthless king. Or that person is a righteous king. They're not going to see the world that we understand. They're going to see the kingdoms that they've understood. And what they're looking for is to stop the chaos from destroying their kingdom. So they're going to see the tyranny. They're going to understand it. They're going to see the abuse. They're going to see the death and the murder and the killing and the abortion transgenderism, all of these things, they're going to see it and they're going to go, these are the things that we were fighting. These are the things that we were trying to prevent from coming into the kingdom. So the reason why we're learning Torah and we're learning to appreciate the gospel message is so that we could fight the fight that they fought. And the more we fight that battle, the more you go into the system and fight that battle, the brighter the light gets. And the more people are going to be drawn to what you're doing, not what you're waiting to see done, <laughs> what you are doing. We've got a generation of young people that are being told it's okay to not be male or female. We're the ones that's got to tell them, eh, that's not okay. We're the ones that have got to, we have to be the ones to go down to the courthouse and say, yeah, that's not okay. The problem is, we're afraid. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, not the fear of men. The fear of men is the beginning of bondage and slavery and death and destruction. So if every one of those people that we're sitting here studying Torah through were walking around in this world today, they would credit the ability of God Almighty in spite of everything that's wrong in the earth, all the miracles they're seeing. And they would say to all of us, look what you have done. This is what God has given to you. And look what you've done with it. Look at these buildings, these planes flying all over the place. I can, a toilet? Really? <laughs> See, the simple things. See, God is still building his kingdom. 
and you're still part of that process. We are part of the process. Now you have to choose. Are you going to represent the instructions of the king? Or are you going to be afraid of the intrusion of the pharaohs? So my heart is, I'm not religious. I run from religious conversations because I see the kingdom of God. If you understand the ancient world, when you get into the suzerain vassal legal systems and you begin to see how their laws worked, the temple was the center of government in almost every kingdom. So I was talking to Daniel McGurr. I had interviewed him on my radio show many, several years ago. Um, Daniel's a friend of mine. Who's, uh, his ministry is Covenant. I, I can't think of it right now. Sorry, Daniel. Ancient Covenant. Ancient Covenant. And um, while I was talking to him, I started seeing the White House as the Palace of Solomon. And I started seeing the Capitol building as the Temple of Israel. And then I went, oh my God, in Moscow, you have the Kremlin. In China, it's in Beijing. In Britain, it's the Parliament building. And I'm going, oh my God, we're not a, we're not a new thing, we're a product of the original thing. So I'm going, Lord, the Capitol building is, is our temple. Yes. And we've got a bunch of corrupt, godless, uncommitted, uncovenant, un people in the Capitol building. So I remember when Yeshua went in there, he started cleaning house. He started throwing the corruption out of his house, out of his government. <laughs> and I went, oh my God. Till he got tired of it, and the consequence to not doing what we're supposed to do is he burnt the house down and threw the Jews out of land. Done it twice. You ever notice how when a tyrannical government comes in, they destroy your government first? and then they enslave your people? Well, guess who created that motif? It's the God that we serve. <laughs> that's, that's his playbook. We have Israel to, to really understand that by. Th my question is, are we going to allow God to burn down our house and throw us out of the land? See, here's the beautiful thing about America. It's the first country in the history of the world where you had the loudest voice. Mm -hmm. And in this nation, there were forces trying to enslave. The slave trade. The Arab, Arab slave, slave trade. The European slave trade. The American slave trade. It's, that's kind of the same kind of deal we're dealing with now. Because if we don't do what needs to be done, they're going to enslave us. That's how it works. Where in history has that been any different? So the reason we're understanding this biblical world, it's not so we can understand the religious nature of God. Right. It's so that we can take up the mantle of the covenant promise that we agreed to do to represent his instructions. A child watches by what we do, not what we say. So if we're not doing what we're learning, then what's the point? And how many of us understood when we said, when we invited Jesus into our heart, how many of us understood what we were really getting involved in? So we didn't. We don't. We don't understand. And, and, and because you brought that up, that's why the church is muted, duct taped, and thrown in the closet. But it was the church that God used to secure this government. Right. We all come from the church. Mm -hmm. 
The problem is we don't understand our obligation. Right. Those people, think about this, our founding fathers. The Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States is a brilliant piece of paper. It is a brilliant document because it gives you the right and the voice. It took 87 years for the people of this nation to crush the slave trade. 87 years to kick it out. And we were fighting one group of people to get rid of it. Well, we're fighting that same group of people today to bring in the kind of freedom that God wants us to all enjoy. Mm -hmm. And David was fighting that same kind of thing. And Abraham was fighting that same kind of thing. And Esther was fighting that same kind of thing. We just celebrated Purim. Esther stood for the Torah. The gospel is a reminder of what we have to get back to. <clears throat> so my message to everybody is, you are the kingdom. This is the kingdom. God's not coming down here to scoop us up and take us to the other side of Jupiter. He's coming down here to reside in Jerusalem and to bring a righteous government, one that, it, we talked about this. Joe and I talked about this. Well, what's going to happen? Oh, God's going to come and it's going to be a utopia. No. Instead of worrying about the judge judging you falsely, he's going to judge you righteously because he's going to understand his obligation. <clears throat> There's things that the Lord is trying to correct and restore. He's doing it through us. He, he didn't send down you know, this great big video and say, okay, everybody, I want you to watch. He said, I want you to commit. For me, this has been, see, it's not about religion t to me. It's not. It's about what is my obligation to the covenant that I agreed to when I accepted the king of glory? Mm -hmm. What is my role? <clears throat> and if we don't do our part, there are other people in the world that don't see my world mm -hmm. view. They want to put me in chains. They want to kill my children. They want to destroy my family. They want to destroy my country. They want to burn down my house. They want me to say yes to them. Mm -hmm. And if I, if I don't understand what it means to say yes to God, they win. Mm -hmm. That's why the church is muted, duct taped, and thrown in the closet because we don't understand. We've lost our ability to stand up and say, no, this is not acceptable. You can't have my children. You can't pervert my wife, God's daughters. You can't continue to rob my identity in Mashiach. We're not going to let you no matter what the cost. That's what brings the kingdom to all of humanity. And Skip Moen, Professor Skip Moen says, the further we get from God, the less human we become. And folks, the further the church has gotten from God, the less committed we've become. We, we kind of look just like the people we have to battle. That's a problem. Another, and we're, we're going to wrap in just a little bit, but another crazy just twist that you've helped me along with <clears throat> is what you just said. Let, think about this. How many of us have grown up under the concept that I need to, get a, I need to be rescued from my humanity because my humanity is corrupt and sin-filled and, right, wretched, I mean, we wrote songs about it. But listen to what Jeff just said. 
the further we get from God, the less human we become. In our, a lot of our minds, that's the goal, to become less human and more godly. But the closer to God we are, the more human we are. Because when God created us, he created something good. Right. Something that he wanted to partner with and to dwell inside of, to dwell with. What an incredible reversal. How many, how, many, how many Christians do you know that love God and are, are faithful and doing their best to, to be faithful but are struggling with insecurity and oppression and depression and all the toxicity because of theology, because of religion, because they've been told you're a sinful wreck and you need Jesus. And they go, Craig, sign me up. And they go, well, you, you got Jesus, but you're, you're still... How, 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 men, how much mental illness has the doctrines of our upbringings created? Ask my generation. Yeah, ask Kyle's generation. Because you know what? They're running. They're running full blast from anything having to do with church or Christianity or belief or, or faith or anything else. The further we get from God, the less... Less human we be. So that means the closer we get, the more human. The more humanity shines, the light goes on, and the house is built, the kingdom is realized, and the presence of God is joined. I mean, that's how it works. <laughs> so, so I want to share something as a final thought with all of you. Because one of the things that holds us back the most is ourselves. Because we, we kind of look at ourselves and because we've gotten so far from God we blame ourselves for, the, for our failures for our mistakes and God says hey I created mistakes and failures so you can understand me a little bit better so I was, I was having a moment one night I was feeling terrible I'm not perfect ask my wife who's watching and I was in, I was in uh, El Shaddai Ministries it was a, a Wednesday night teaching thing and I'm feeling really depressed and bummed out and just horrible inside. And so I'm standing up there in the front row because I always sit in the front row. And I start crying because I felt like I didn't deserve to be here. And as I was going through all this emotional, yucky stuff, I heard this little whisper in my ear. It was like, yeah, with all that stuff that you're standing here crying about, do you know how much I appreciate what you do for me? Whew, that just blew me away. Because the Lord knows who we are. He knows our failures. He honors what we do for him in spite of all of that. In fact, that's where the blessings pour out is because with all that corruption, all that stuff in your life that's hidden that nobody knows about, you're still willing to serve the king. That's what he sees. And he gives us Torah and he gives us the gospel message as a road map to get beyond that place. So when Abraham saw the light go on, when Joshua saw the toilet, when the disciples saw the airplanes, they're thinking, in spite of everything, that we have failed to do. Look at what God has done. Through us. Mm -hmm. So the kingdom is being built. Whether you do anything or not. Whether I do anything or not. The kingdom of God is under construction. When you see a building going up know that God is using the hands of those people to raise that up. 
And there are people in this world that want to bring that down. That's the battle. So when you decide to enter into this battle, the one thing that that world has to contend with is the light of the presence of God in you. The strength of the Torah. The promise of the gospel. Now, as a final thought, imagine Abraham walking around in Haifa. Imagine the disciples seeing the government of Israel the restoration of the land of God. Imagine those people if they were able to walk around in the rebirth of the nation of Israel, the kingdom of Israel. They would think, wow, he promised that he would rebuild the land. (laughs) He promised that, (laughs) that he would bring us home. And they would realize the kingdom of Israel is surrounded by relatives that want to hurt them. Don't be afraid of your relatives. They need you to stand up. So those men, they would look at Israel and they would go, he kept his promise. And look what they've done. They would marvel at who we've become not what we failed to do that's who you are that's who I am just don't be afraid to be what he created that's why I named my website free from fear God gifted this nation to a people who was willing to fight we are that people I always tell people I'm not a product of slavery I'm a product of freedom because when I realize the freedom that I can experience in this nation I can say goodbye to the anger of slavery and I know that this body is just a vehicle I always tell people I feel like I'm in a taxi cab mine happens to be light brown And the Lord is driving, and I get to see everything he's doing while he takes me to where I'm going. And eventually, he's going to ask me to get out of that cab Mm. because we've arrived. And so I can't see this body as being anything other than what houses who God created. That's who we are. And something for you ladies, I want to say this again. I had a moment with the Lord. It was a powerful experience. And God showed me something about women. I'm writing a book. You know, it's kind of three years long. But he showed me that in our culture, because of religion, women were the second thing. It's not good for the man to be alone. I shall make for a helpmeet. That is so much misunderstood. My wife and I got divorced. She divorced me. Then she called me and said, I think I screwed up. I'm sorry, honey. I got to say that. But the day she called me was the day that I was recovering from cancer surgery. I had staples from here to here up to here. And to breathe in air felt like a blowtorch going down my throat. So I'm sitting in this house three days after surgery, it was a Wednesday, and uh, I hadn't seen my wife for six months. We were divorced. We're remarried now. And this guy, James, gave me this book. It's called The Garden of Peace. I recommend every man in this room read it, but not one woman read it. Because if women read it, they'll have all the ammunition they need to, <laughs> to hurt us. <laughs> But James gave me this book, and I read it before this all happened. I read two chapters. I threw the book across the room. I'm like, my wife divorced me. I don't want to read this crap. 
that day I picked up this book because I was bored and I thought, okay, I'll read it. Now I got stitches. I got a drain tube here. Everything's draining. I'm a mess. And the worst thing that can happen to you when you've had throat surgery is for you to cry because you already can't breathe down your throat. Now if your nose gets all backed up with all the yuck, you can't breathe. So I'm sitting there <laughs> reading this book, and in the book he goes, women are my voice box, my hearing aid. And I'm sitting here, and I'm going, whoa. This is chapter three, because I only made it to chapter two. <laughs> so I'm sitting here, and all of a sudden, this is the presence of the Lord filled up the room. I was all by myself. And I began to see kind of how God sees women. It was mind-blowing. I can't, I can't relate it to you. And I start crying. I'm a mess, guys. I got stuff coming out of my nose. I can't breathe. <gasps> Drain tube is pumping stuff out of me. And I'm like, <gasps> and the phone rings. It's my wife. I hadn't talked to her for six months. She said, how you doing? Oh, I'm fine. I'm, I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> and we had this little conversation. And while we're having this conversation, I could hear the Lord saying to me, you're my hands, but she's my heart. And if you can't serve my heart, then your hands are worthless to me. So I hung up the phone and uh, I realized that women were not the second thing created, if you will. They were the second battery in the remote. Nothing works if that second battery is not in there. Nothing in God's creation works if his daughters are treated less than the second battery. So when I began to see that, I started writing this book. My mom told me, she said, I've never known a love of man, and it's all this stuff catapulted. And as I started reading this book, I began to realize through history, I learned from the academic world for the most part, because the seminary world is kind of stuck. So I want to learn what a person's been studying for 70 years. And as I started learning about women and the abuses that women have had in different societies and how it's affected the societies, there's an absolute cause and effect. So I would say to the women in this room, this is a big thing for me. The most spectacular thing in all of creation stares at you every single time you look in the mirror. Every single time. Because it took the heart of the Father to bring forth life. And that's exactly what you all do. So just remember that. As you go into this place to bring the kingdom here, you're a second battery. Nothing works if you're not active. We, we do, guys do this. We got the TV, the, the remote, we got the DVD player. We're, the whole room is a mess. We're not looking at the instructions or nothing. The wife comes around the corner. She says, well, maybe you ought to put that over there and this over there and uh, well, I could have told you to tell your son to put the other battery in the remote because that's the voice box of God. That's the sound of... He's trying to tell you something through his heart so that you can use his hands to bring forth the kingdom of God. The two have to work together. So God bless you all. I appreciate you having me here. And um, this is an amazing thing that we're... This is so big. What makes it so small is our religious interpretation. The United States is 244 years old. And it's the first nation on the planet where God gave you the loudest voice. Don't let it.
be silenced. God bless you guys. Amen. Give him a hand. Amen. I'll just say this again, just not to beat a dead horse. But if, if you're uncomfortable watching or here listening, and something inside of you says, is uncomfortable a little bit with correlating America to the gospel or to the kingdom, ask God to, to open up your deepest understanding this week. Because this is what he gave us. And if we can't bring kingdom here, it's not going to come through any other means. Because nope. we don't serve a God of magic. <laughs> Amen. We serve a God who partners with his creation. Yep. So, Amen. Uh, let me plug a couple things just real quick. Freefromfear.us. We'll put links to everything on Facebook and our website. Um, Freefromfear.us. Jeff's got, he's got merch. I got merch and He's got merch. Um, you can go buy my stuff now. Yeah. Uh, but he's also got uh, the book. Um, yeah, why don't you do something with that right now? Yeah. Um, I, only brought, me, I only brought a couple. We're going to get some more of these, uh, but I just want you to see it. Um, Uncoloring Race is, is Jeff's story. And um, a, a incredible book. Um, so I, I want to make sure that we get some more of these because some of you some of you will want want them and you will need to read them. Um, Free from fear, returning to Eden podcast. If you listen to podcasts, uh, make sure you check out Return to Eden with He and uh, Doctor Dina Die. And um, man, I just can't say thank you enough. I, Amen. You thank agree? you. Well, you got you guys have no idea how much you bless me. Because I'm not in the Third Reich, and I get to see what it looks like. <laughs> it's, it's horrible. You, you have no idea. So you guys have blessed me in ways that you don't even know because you're not living in the Gestapo land of Washington State. It's bad up there. Jeff hadn't had to wear a mask all week. I've had people chase me around the store saying, Sir, your mask's not on. Cover your nose. I had one lady... I came out of Home Depot. She looked at me like I wasn't wearing a mask, and she looked at me like I was horrible. And she did a, she stopped and then started doing a full circle around me, looking at me like, hmm, hmm, hmm. And I, I, before she got too far away, I went, you hate black people that much? <laughs> and she went on in the building and gave me a dirty look. But that's what we're dealing with. I've been so blessed to not see Black Lives Matter signs down here. All lives matter, especially our children. This is not a, this book cover, Art Palachek designed this for me, is by the blood of the lamb. There is no color, it's all gray. And this, I should have named this Uncoloring Stupid. Because the kingdom of God is color beautiful. And I'll just say this to clarify. Jeff is not saying these things about race and stuff as some Uncle Tom kind of... Jeff has experienced racial hatred and he's experienced it firsthand. He's saying it in spite of it. What God has done in spite of it. It's, it's beautiful. So I want to give everybody a chance to visit you know, some more with Jeff this afternoon and stuff. So... Goodbye to everybody uh, on live stream. Thank you all for joining us. Um, we'll cut out uh, this portion of it and uh, post it to YouTube probably tomorrow so you can check that out and we'll share it in all the, all the places. We love you. We bless you. Let us pray for you, you before we go. Avinu Malkinu, our Father and our King. Avinu Shabbat our Father in Heaven. We are just overwhelmed at all the things that you've spoken through Jeff, the things that you've been speaking at OAM that we need to process father and we need to we need your help we need your spirit in helping us to understand who we are and what you've asked us to do when we when we signed on to to following the God of of Israel father we didn't really understand what we were being called to do and father we need your help yeah. we need your help in helping us to shed all of that stuff to unlearn. I wish I'd have had a download like Jeff where everything was just wiped, my hard drive was just wiped clean and I could start over. Mm -hmm. 
But Father, for most of us, you know that we are having to unlearn as much as we're having to learn, or maybe more. And Father, we are, we're not complaining. We are more thankful for this journey. For the first time in many of our lives, we feel like we know God. We feel like we understand, and we, we love the scriptures, and we love faith, and, and we love being together. And this is more real to us today. Some of us may have been, been Christians and been following you, Father, for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. And for most of us, it's more real today than it's ever been. And so we're just so thankful. And I pray for those of our live stream family, you would, you would speak to them this week, encourage them this week, activate them this week. And as Jeff says, I love, if no one does anything, nothing gets done. So, Father, I pray that you activate us. Salvation is activation. Yes, Lord. To go and love your people. Not just the people that follow you, but your people, creation, humanity. And we ask that you empower us, Father, to spread the borders of your kingdom and to represent your image well. We love our online family, and we ask your blessings through Yeshua, our Messiah, for his name's sake, for the name of the Father. Amen and amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah.